All right, chapter nine uh, is about confidence intervals, okay? And there are two different types of confidence intervals. 9.1 is about confidence intervals with proportions. And when we get to 9.2, then we're going to be talking about confidence intervals with means, okay? Oh. Sorry, that's page six, I think. Confidence intervals with means, okay? All right, so the big difference there is what type of question are you asking people? If you're asking people a yes or no question, you're dealing with proportions. So, for example, if you went around and you said, hey, do you like chocolate chip cookies, yes or no? You're finding the proportion of people who like chocolate chip cookies. If you ask people, do you watch the TV show Friends, yes or no? Do, are you a Cowboys fan, Dallas Cowboys fan, yes or no? Hopefully they all say yes because you should be a Dallas Cowboys fan, okay? Um, you know, if you ask them a yes or no type question, you're dealing with proportions. That's in 9.1, okay? In 9.2, we're going to be dealing with means. So if your survey question was a, a number answer that they had to give you. So, for instance, if you said, how many hours a week do you work? How many credit hours are you taking this semester in college? How many kids do you have? What's your hourly salary at your job? Okay, All of the answers to those questions are numbers. So what you're going to be doing in that case is finding the mean or the average value that each person gave you. Okay, it's going to be a slightly different approach. We'll use slight, uh, the, the idea of a confidence interval is the same, but the process in your calculator will be a little bit different, and, and the sentence we write for our conclusion will be slightly different. Okay, So in 9.1, we are focused on proportions. We are assuming that the survey question we asked people was a yes or no question. Do you like chocolate chip cookies? Yes or no. Um, do you like the Cowboys? Yes or no. Do you watch Friends? Yes or no. It's a yes or no question. Okay. All right. When we do proportions, um, we have a different symbol for sample than we do for populations. When we're working with samples, our symbol is P hat. When we're working with uh, the population, the entire group, our symbol is P. So if I go around and I survey, you know, 100 people and I say, do you like chocolate chip cookies, yes or no, and it turns out that 70% of them do like chocolate chip cookies, then my P hat would be 0.7. 70 out of 100 people like chocolate chip cookies, that's 0.7, okay? Now, generally, if you're using a confidence interval, you are trying to take some data that you got from your sample, your P hat, and you are using it to predict P. Well, if 70% of the people in my sample like chocolate chip cookies, then I bet around 70% of my people in my whole population like chocolate chip cookies. Okay, so I'm predicting that 0.7 in my is my P value as well as my P as well because that's the percent of my whole population that likes chocolate chip cookies. Is there any guarantee that the percent or the decimal that I got from my sample matches my population? No, there's no guarantee that those match. But it should probably be pretty close if I've done a good job in my calculations. It may be 68%, it may be 75%, but it ought to be fairly close if I've done good statistical procedures. Okay? All right, so where does this P hat come from? It's how many successes you got out of how many trials. Okay, remember N is your sample size. So if 70 people out of 100 like chocolate chip cookies, 70 over 100 is 0.7. Okay, with all confidence intervals, whether it's based on means or based on samples, we're going to use something called a point estimate. Okay, a point estimate is the statistic, the single number that you get from your sample. Statistics come from samples, right? So 0.7 was my p hat, was my uh, percentage of people that I got in my sample. I am going to use it to predict the population parameter. Remember, populations have parameters, okay? All right. Now, keep in mind that I, I, it's not going to be exactly the same necessarily, but it ought to be close. All right, so for example, I estimate that the proportion of female students enrolled in statistics is 0.84, okay? The point estimate in that case is my P hat number, okay? That's the middle number in my confidence interval, okay? 
I'm building a confidence interval around it, okay? So I know, hey, 0.84 was, you know, the, the p hat from my sample in my, you know, maybe I went to one class and I said, I counted the males and I counted the females. And I said, oh, look, 84% are female, okay. Well, in all statistics classes, it may not be 0.84. So I'm going to build an interval around it. 0.84 will be in the middle, but I'm going to build a little cushion above and below to allow for a little bit of, of difference, allow me to be a little bit off compared to the whole population. So notice that when they build their confidence interval, they said, hey, I estimate the true proportion of female students in statistics is between 0.82 and 0.86. Okay? So they really think it's 0.84, but they're building a little bit of cushion around it because they know that they may be off a little compared to the whole population. Okay? That um, amount that you're off by is called our margin of error. Okay? In this case, how far apart are 0.82 and 0.84? Well, 0.84 minus 0.82 is 0 0.02. 0 0.86 to 0.84 is also 0 0.02. It should be the same distance on each side, okay? So our margin for error, we're going to call that E, is going to be 0 0.02. The margin of error is how much you could be off by, okay? All right, so uh, how, are we, how do we create confidence intervals? We took, take our point estimate and we put it in the middle. So P hat will be right there in the middle. Then you count over your margin of error to the right, and the upper bound of your, your confidence interval will be P hat plus that margin of error you also have to count back that E, that margin of error. So your lower bound is P hat minus E. So your confidence interval, notice the lower limit here was 0.82, the upper was 0.86, because both of those were 0.02 away from our point estimate of 0.84, okay? That's how we create confidence intervals. You put your P hat in the middle, or whatever your point estimate is, and you allow for plus minus however much your margin of error is, okay? Now, that margin of error, how big should that margin of error be? Well, it depends, okay? And one of the things it depends on is how confident you want to be. Do you want to be 90% confident that your interval is good or 95% confident or 99% confident? How confident do you want to be that the results of your confidence interval are correct, okay? Um, as you increase your confidence, your interval is going to have to get wider, okay? Um, for example, let's say that I asked you, hey, what do you, how'd you do on your last test? What do you think you made? And you go, you know what? My point estimate, what I think I got on that test was maybe an 80. But I know I might be off a little. I might be off by about five points or so. So you go, okay, 80 plus or minus five. That's my confidence interval, okay? Well, so 80 plus five would put you at a high score of 85. 80 minus 5 would put you at a low score of 75. Notice that 80 would be right there in the middle. Okay, your confidence interval would be 75 to 85. But let's say that I turned around and I said, okay, you want to bet some money on that? Or, or back up, back up. I said, how confident are you? And you go, yeah, I'm pretty confident. I'm 90% confident that, that's, that I scored somewhere between 75 and 85. And I say, cool. You want to put some money on that? And you're going to make a bet. And you go, well, hmm. I'm going to make a bet. i got a lot more writing on this. I want to be more confident. I'm going to increase my confidence. Okay? I'm no longer 90% confident because I bet money. i got to be like 99% confident. i got to be real confident. So in that case, you still think you made an 80, but it's your margin of error that's going to change. You're going to make your margin of error a bigger number, like 10. Okay, well, 80 plus 10 is 90. 80 minus 10 is 70. Your middle number is still 80, but your, your margin of error has increased because you got more writing on this. You bet money. You want to be more confident that your true score is in between those cutoff numbers. 
okay? So notice your 70 is lower and that 90 is higher than your original confidence interval created, okay? So as your level of confidence increases, so does the margin of error. That E value gets bigger, okay? So I'm going to make a little note here. I'm going to write confidence up. That means your margin of error is up. Your interval is wider. Okay? Your original interval might have been this wide, but if you want to raise your confidence, your interval is going to get wider. Okay? So less confident is skinny, more confident. The interval is going to get wider. Okay. Another thing that will impact uh, how wide or, or narrow your confidence inter interval is is the sample size. Okay. As you survey more and more and more people, you ask more and more people, do you like chocolate chip cookies? Do you like the show Friends? Are you a Dallas Cowboys fan? As you survey more and more people, your margin of error is going to decrease because if you survey a lot of people, they're pretty confident in what their results are. Okay, if you only survey five or six people, well, who knows how confident you are? You know, you're probably not very confident that their results match the whole population. But if you survey a lot of people, then you're pretty sure that the results from that survey are going to match the whole population. Okay, so as sample size, remember we use the variable n to re represent sample size. As sample size goes up, your margin of error will go down. You are more con I'm sorry, you are more confident in those results, and so your your uh, error will go down. Your interval will get skinnier. Okay. And then the larger the spread in the population, the wider the interval is going to be. In other words, um, you know, if, if if you survey people and you get all kinds of different responses, okay, um, then you're probably going to have a pretty wide interval because people are all over the place in their responses. Okay? All right. Um, back to this level of confidence right here. Uh, notice, you know, as your confidence level increases 90%, 95 to 99%, your confidence is going up. That means your interval is going to get wider. Alpha is the remaining percent that would get you to 100. Okay? So, for instance, if I'm 90% confident, the decimal of that is 0.90. How much do I need to get to, to 1 or to 100% is 0.1, so my alpha is 0.1, okay? If I want to be 95% confident, that decimal is 0.95, my alpha is 0.05, that's the remaining portion to get me to 1. If I'm 99% confident, that decimal is 0.99, my alpha is 0.01, okay? Now, we're going to talk a lot more in, about alpha in Chapter 10 when we get to hypothesis tests. But for right now, just know that alpha is the remaining decimal that would combine with your level of confidence to get to 1. Okay? That level of confidence is what they're talking about right there. Okay? Um, and it represents the expected proportion of intervals that contain the true population parameter if you had enough samples uh, obtained. Okay? All right, so more on that right here. Let's talk for just a second about how to uh, interpret a confidence interval and what it means. Use this as like a little sentence starter or a sentence frame when you are interpreting your results. Your sentence is always, always, always going to be, I am however percent confident that the true proportion of whatever the category is, is between blank and blank. In other words, maybe we say, I am 95% confident that the true proportion of people who like chocolate chip cookies is between 0.6 and 0.8. Okay, I'm saying that kind of high because I think probably a lot of people like chocolate chip cookies. Okay, we had said it was 70% you know, while ago. All right. So um, I'm 95% confident that the true proportion of people who like chocolate chip cookies is between 0.6 and 0.8. Maybe it's I am 90% confident that the true proportion of people who are Dallas Cowboy fans is between 0.5 and 0.8. Maybe it's I am 99% confident that the true proportion of people who like the TV show Friends is between 
0.75 and 0.85. Okay, so whatever your category is, your sentence will always match that same format. Okay, <clears throat> here's what level of confidence does not say. It does not say that there's a 95% probability that the parameter lies between the upper and lower points. It does not say that. Okay. Sometimes people get hung up on those words, so I just tell them always phrase your sentence this way when you're writing your conclusions. Okay. And let me give you an example of what that means. <clears throat> let's go back to the chocolate chip cookie example. And let's say that I go to a grocery store and I survey 100 different people, hey, do you like chocolate chip cookies, yes or no? Okay, and at the grocery store, 70%, uh, let's say 0 0.72, 0 0.72, 72% of the people like chocolate chip cookies. And I build a confidence interval, and maybe my confidence interval comes out to be 0 0.68 to 0 0.76. Notice that would be 0.04 away on each side. Okay, and then maybe I go to the mall and I survey people, and I say, hey, you know, do you like chocolate chip cookies? And maybe 75% of them like chocolate chip cookies. And I build a confidence interval, and maybe I get 0.7 to 0.8. And then maybe I come to the college, and I survey a bunch of people, and I say, hey, do you like chocolate chip cookies? And 0.6 of them, so 60% like chocolate chip cookies. And my confidence interval there comes out to be 0.5, uh, uh, 1, up to 0.69 or something like that, okay? So maybe I do a whole bunch of these surveys. They all have different P hats. They all have different point estimates. It's different for all of them. They also have different confidence intervals. But if I took all of those confidence intervals and I graphed them on a little line, let's, let's pretend that in real life the true P is 0.7. 70% of all people really do like chocolate chip cookies. Okay, let's say I, I actually know that. Well, my true proportion, okay, my P, should be 0.7. So what they've done here is they took all these different samples that they got, all these different uh, confidence intervals, and they spread them out. So one goes from 0.68 to 0.76. And another one goes from 0.7 to 0.8. And another one goes from 0.51 to 0.69. And we stretch all of those confidence intervals out. Because we built all of these confidence intervals on 95% confident, 95% of all the intervals that we created here contain the true population parameter of 0.7. 95% of these lines have 0.7 going right through them. The ones that don't are these little red ones. See how this little red one right here, it started to the right of that 0.7 and goes further to the right. So the little red ones on here do not contain 0.7, the true population parameter. But 95% of these intervals do contain it. And that's what we mean by a confidence interval, okay? One more thing about confidence intervals. Notice we said that usually um, the most common confidence intervals are going to be 90%, 95%, and 99%. Okay? We can never be able to calculate a 100% confidence interval. You cannot be 100% confident. Okay? Um, there's always some margin for error. The only way you could be 100% confident is if you surveyed every single person in your, in your population. Well, if you surveyed every single person in your population, it's not a sample anymore. You just know the result for your whole population. So there's no need for you to build a confidence interval. Okay? So the population, uh, you know, you're always using it to predict your population, so you can't know everybody's opinion. So you can't be 100% confident. The highest you could go is 99%. Okay? Um, there are a couple of requirements going on behind the scenes in order to be able to calculate a confidence interval. One, and you probably remember this from our, our last unit, uh, the last unit we said NPQ had to be greater than or equal to 10. And remember uh, when we did our, our binomials and that NPQ was greater than 10, we knew we had a bell-shaped data set. Okay? So that's still what this is saying. NP hat Q hat is greater than or equal to 10, because then we know it's bell-shaped or a normal distribution, okay? Um, remember, the P hat will come from your sample, and then the Q hat would be the proportion that we're not. So if 70% do like chocolate chip cookies, 30% do not like chocolate chip cookies. So your sample size times the percent who like 
chocolate chip cookies times the percent that do not like chocolate chip cookies has to be greater than or equal to 10, okay? Um, the other requirement is that your sample size is no more than 5% of the population. Um, if you start surveying, I mentioned a while ago, let's say you surveyed every single person in your population, you don't need to be doing a confidence interval anymore. You already know the results of your whole population. So in order to be using these uh, confidence intervals, we assume that your sample size is less than 5% of your population, okay? And then in the next video, I'll show you how to type these in your calculator and we'll work some sample problems.